Okay, today I'll be presenting the City Court building, uh, the case of that. All right, so to intro introduce the whole situation, my thesis is that Lemester does not deserve the level of praise given him in the case. And that is for, in this, in this presentation, the dishonesty and the secrecy uh, that he had with respect to the situation. And that is because he partially failed the utilitarian ethical approach and he also failed the respect for persons ethical approach. So we'll start with the narrative. So in the 1960s, the late 1960s to the early 1970s, uh, City Corp, which is a bank and a financial firm, they needed a new building. Uh, and they were currently located in New York City because they were growing and expanding, so they needed a new building. And they ended up buying almost the entire block across the street from their current building. But there was a, a church on the corner and it was run down and they didn't have enough money for repairs, but they still wanted, uh, wanted to still have a church there. So their terms for the sale to Citicorp of the land was that they wanted the church to be rebuilt, but it had nothing to do with Citicorp, uh, a completely different building. So Citicorp needed a new design, a new type of design for, for this problem. And they ended up hiring an engineering firm owned by Hugh Stubbins, who was an architect, and he worked with a structural engineer named uh, Lemessur. So when Mr. Sturr is thinking of a solution and what he decides on is that the building should be suspended in the air on four columns and each one is in the center of the side instead of on each corner, which is a little different than most, most buildings in New York. So it also had a chevron kind of zigzag diagonal pattern of structural bracing. And at the top, there was a tune mass damper system, which uh, reduced the sway of the building up to about 50% because the building was a little lighter than most other buildings and it was eventually completed in 1977. So here's a, a picture of the chevron diagonal bracing here and here are uh, here are the two columns there's two behind these two on the, the opposite sides of the building but you can't see them so there's four and they're each in the middle of each each face of the building. So a year after the building's completed, there's a, a Princeton student and she's working on her, her undergraduate thesis statement, uh, Diane Hartley. And she writes to Lemessur because she requested the drawings for the building and she went through the calculations and found that there's too much stress that would be safe on the building by quartering winds. So Lemessur begins investigating his own work. And what he finds is that in the calculations, the bracings of the building were treated as trusses when they should have been treated as columns. And because of that, only half of the bolts were used in the bracing connections that were and should have been. So the stress doubled on uh, certain areas in each floor. And Lemester basically flew to Canada to do wind tunnel tests with, with someone he designed the building with. And the results were that there were indeed not enough structural support in the building and actually 70 mile per hour winds would topple the building and hurricane season was actually coming too so it was really urgent that that the building was repaired so he created a plan and the repairs should have been simple because they were easily accessible all the all the joints were easily accessible between between floors and he also he also made the plans so where it disturbed employees as little as possible employees are working in the city court building. And after this, Lemister has to speak with city court management because they've got to approve of the, of the repairs and actually find out about the, the problem. So he told them and then they ended up discussing repair plans. And what they settled on was that they would weld two inch thick gusset plates on uh, all the bolted connections. And after this, they submitted the drawings for the repairs to the Department of Buildings in New York, and then the repairs began. But during all of this, the public didn't know that there was actually a problem. There, there were press statements released, 
but Lemister and City Corp didn't acknowledge that the that there was a problem with the building. They they just said that the repairs were actually just improvements that were recommended by the engineers, just to just to strengthen the building. And eventually the repairs were completed in October 1978, which was about four months after uh, Diane Hartley wrote to Lemister about her discovery. Almost 17 years later, though, in 1995, the, there was an article in The New Yorker, and it was wrote by George uh, Joe Morgenstern. And in this article, he basically tells the entire story of the city court building and the flaws and the repairs and everything. But instead of there being a large scandal, Lemester actually received lots of praise from the public and the engineering community because he owned up to his mistakes and he fixed them pretty quickly. And after all this, in total, the repairs cost over $8 million in estimate. And the City Corp building actually became one of the safest buildings in New York City. And also, Lemonster's reputation rose, and also that of his engineering firm also rose instead of decreasing. On to the, the ethics. So there were three main parties involved in the, in the dishonesty and the, the secrecy of the situation because they were pretty much the only ones that knew about uh, the problems. And that was Lemonster, the city court management, and the local government of uh, New York City. But since Lemonster received most of the praise, he's going to be the focus of the ethical analysis and his dishonesty. And what includes him is that one, he claimed that the building had well over the structural support that was needed for the building to be safe. And he also organized the repairs for them to be completed without the public knowing. And he hid the truth until it came out uh, almost 17 years later. So the first approach we'll be using is the utilitarian approach. And the goal is to maximize overall well-being of uh, every everyone involved, all the parties the clinical audience involved. And looking at it from a general standpoint, he failed and passed because one, he endangered the lives of 200,000 people, which would be everyone in the city court building and all around it. So he failed uh, to maximize overall well-being in that way by endangering them. But he also uh, passed the ethical approach because he did prevent mass panic uh, from fear. And that comes from like the mindset of what you don't know can't hurt you. So uh, they wouldn't be in fear and they'd be in a well-being. But if you look at two tests that uh, accompany the utilitarian approach, uh, the first one is the cost-benefit analysis. And he failed this because human lives, especially 200,000 human lives, uh, definitely outvalues uh, the money that could have been lost from uh, pausing work if that needed to be done for the, uh, the repairs to be completed. And in maximizing the consequences, he passed this test because there were more reasons to keep uh, the instability and the repairs a secret than to go public. But uh, there were also, uh, the reasons to go public were also more important. So that was, that's one flaw, but he did pass because there were more, there were more benefits to, uh, to keep it a secret. But onto the respect for persons approach, uh, the goal is to respect people as free and equal moral agents, which basically means they're autonomous people and they can make their own decisions and uh, their own goals. So overall, looking at a general standpoint from this goal, uh, Lemister failed because he endangered these people and they could not assess the risk and uh, make conscious decisions as, as moral agents, whether they, uh, they thought it was okay to go near or work around the city court building because they did not know that it was actually in danger. But specifically, there are three tests that uh, accompany the respect for persons approach. And that is one, the golden rule test, which basically you uh, put yourself in the shoes of the recipient. And if you would not want someone to do the same thing to you, you do not commit an action. And Lemister 
failed this approach because most people would not want to be lied to or uh, or have their lives endangered so if you had used this approach you would have failed because uh you did not act in their favor and next is the self-defeating test which basically says if the action you do if everyone everyone uh, existing were to do it if it were to make the action futile then it's unethical and if everyone tells lies and kept secrets like one is sure then no one would trust each other so lies would be futile and there would be no point in keeping secrets because there's no trust in existence so you should also fail the self-defeating test and the third one is the rights test which basically says that uh you should honor the rights of people that allow them to be a moral agent and that uh one of those rights is the right to life obviously because if you're not living you can't uh you can't be a moral agent so uh the right to life was infringed upon because by endangering the people you do not guarantee that right you actually uh endanger that right and that would also endanger the moral agency of of everyone involved so he also failed the rights test in conclusion one mr failed to act ethically from the utilitarian and the respect for persons approaches however there were flaws in the test like like uh there usually would be and for the cost benefit analysis uh it's hard to put a monetary value on a human life because there's a lot of factors involved in most we consider human lives actually invaluable and that's that was the basis of uh my analyzation but that's also that's one flaw of the cost benefit analysis it's not completely accurate when human lives are involved and there's also a problem with the maximizing good consequences like i said before the the quantity of the benefits is measured but the quality is not so there could be much more important benefits like saving the human life is much more important than saving a dollar right so uh, the quality was not measured of the benefits and then with the golden rule test there's also uh the problem that everyone has different values so we're going on the assumption that everyone or most people would not want to be lied to or uh, have secrets kept from them but uh obviously not everyone thinks the same and some people believe it or not may not may not feel that way however overall nonetheless lemester does not deserve all of the praise that he received for for his response to the to the city court buildings uh, flaws even though it was uh valiant in some ways any questions thank you